Hi everybody, good evening. Uh, welcome to our last session for the live lounge today. Um, if you've managed to catch any of the sessions today, I've managed to catch a few of them and there were some phenomenal sessions. If you missed it, the session with Nevis, um, where she was talking about resilience in the face of adversity, it was utterly inspiring. Um, it is, many of you are tissue viability nurses, um, you could really use Nervous' story again and again and again in teaching. Um, it'll be on our YouTube channel. You could even use it for Stop Pressure Day, if I'm entirely honest. She was just brilliant. Um, so that was a particular highlight for me today. So this is the end of day two. Um, my name's Kate Williams. I am a tissue viability nurse in the community in Leeds, and I'm also a lecturer practitioner at the University of Huddersfield. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today about venous glycolysis. So I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully. You can see that, I'm hoping. And I'll start the slideshow. So we are going to talk about understanding venous leg ulcers. So venous leg ulcers are probably the most common cause of leg ulceration. It's something that we come across in the community all the time and the main thing for me about improving awareness of venous leg ulceration is that we must get better at diagnosing these ulcers earlier and getting them in the proper treatment earlier so we can get good outcomes for patients earlier. So who is this session actually for? Well it's for everybody. So that's for people with concerns about their own legs, Relatives who are concerned about um, uh, a family member's legs, um, nurses who you may have a lot of knowledge about leg ulcers and are wondering about this for training or just to refresh yourself, or nurses who don't really know much about leg ulcers but need to know, would like to know more, doctors who acknowledge that they haven't got um, much knowledge on lower limb and venous leg ulcers. So um, it's for everybody, to be honest. So this is what we're going to be looking at. So we're going to look at what a venous leg ulcer is, what causes a venous leg ulcer, how do you know if you've got a venous leg ulcer, uh, treatment, and then things that you can do if you have a venous leg ulcer, what you can do to help yours to heal. So first of all, I can't talk about venous leg ulcers without showing you pictures of venous leg ulcers. Um, so pictures of wounds can be... Um, unpleasant at times so just be warned there will be pictures of wounds and the pictures that I'm using today are either from, pa either from patients that I've looked after over the years but a lot of them have been kindly loaned to me by Mid York's NHS big thank you to them for sharing their um, imagery with me today so what is a leg ulcer so in the simplest terms a leg ulcer is a wound below the knee not on the foot we'll come back to that which does not heal or improve significantly within two weeks. So you can see this image at the bottom of the screen there, there's a little dotted line. Anything below that dotted line would be classed as a foot ulcer. Foot ulcers are managed by podiatrists. They are wonderful experts in the management of foot ulcers, and this is very much their domain. Today we're talking about leg ulcers, so it's anything from that line up. So that's a generic kind of simple definition of a leg ulcer but we're going to talk tonight specifically about venous leg ulcers. So a venous leg ulcer is a leg ulcer or a wound on your leg that doesn't heal because the veins inside your leg are not working as well as they should. So that is why it's not healing and that is why it's given the title a venous leg ulcer because the problem is with the veins inside your leg. So when you get veins in your leg that are not working as well as they should, it's known as venous hypertension. So that in itself just means high pressure within the venous system. So high pressure in the veins, which is what is causing all the problems. So venous hypertension, you'll also see these other terms banded around. Um, so they all mean the same thing. Venous hypertension, venous disease, venous insufficiency, venous reflux, they're all terms which we use. I'm not sure why we've got so many terms for the same thing. It really doesn't help, but we do. So it's just for you to understand that all these terms mean the same thing. And if you look at this image on the right, this is a lovely picture of a patient with a, some varicose veins. 
So you can see down here there's quite prominent varicose veins. So that is venous hypertension. There is high pressure in that vein, which is making it fat. And then the vein is more visible, prominent, um, and you can see it when you're just glancing at the leg. So this is high pressure within the vein, so venous hypertension. And we need to think about how veins work to really understand venous leg ulcers. So veins are part of your circulatory system. The job of the veins is to return the deoxygenated blood back to the heart. So in a healthy vein, if we just think about legs specifically, um, the arteries bring the blood down to the leg and it is the job of the vein to return the blood up the legs to the heart. Now, the veins have got a difficult job. They have to go against gravity. They're pushing fluid uphill. So there is some pressure within the system, obviously, which helps the, um, the entire circulatory system. But these veins can really struggle because they are pushing blood uphill and gravity is constantly trying to pull it back down. So within the veins, there's valves. You can see here on this image on the left, valves there so that if there's any backflow, so when gravity tries to pull the blood back down, the, the valves will close, there's no backflow, and then um, as the, usually as muscles contract, the vein is squashed and the blood goes back up the leg. But then again, any backflow, the veins will, the valves, sorry, will close and there's no problems. So that is a normal, healthy, functioning vein. There's no backflow back down despite gravity. So in an unhealthy vein on the image on the right, you can see it's, this is a varicose vein. So you distinguish really by the shape, we'll give it away. But the most important thing is you can see down here that the valves don't even touch. The valves aren't working properly. So it could be that the valves don't touch because the vein is so full and stretched, or it could be that the valves have been damaged or they might not have been there in the first place. Um, so the valves within the vein are not functioning properly so that when gravity pulls, tries to pull the blood back down the leg, there's no healthy valves to stop that happening. So you get this backflow back down the leg, which creates high pressure in the veins and venous hypertension. So I've already mentioned that the muscles around the veins help squeeze the blood back up the leg. The biggest, most important part of that is the calf muscle pump. I can't talk about a calf muscle pump without actually moving my leg. So I find myself moving my leg. So you, many of you will have been on long haul flights. Um, uh, many of you will have sat and done ankle exercises, calf raises, worn compression hosiery maybe on a long haul flight. And that's all to prevent deep vein thrombosis on flights. But the whole idea of those ankle exercises on flights, wearing compression hosiery on flights, is to support and activate the calf muscle pump because it is the huge, powerful pump that pumps the blood, push squashes the veins and helps the blood shoot back up to the, um, towards the heart. So I can't underestimate how important this is. So if you or one of your patients has trouble walking, if you have a fixed ankle, perhaps you've had ankle surgery or you've had some trauma to your leg and you can't flex your ankle, or if it's just your mobility is quite poor and you tend to shuffle when you walk, you're not using your calf muscle effectively. So this can be really quite damaging for the veins because they're not getting that powerful squeeze every time you walk. So things like ankle exercises as you're sitting, as I'm doing now, anything to exercise the calf muscle pump, even if you sit with your feet flat on the floor, if you're not able to walk, even just wriggling your toes, I'm also doing that now, I hope you are. <laughs> even just wriggling your toes will exercise the calf muscle some way and help get some good venous return, just to help reduce that high pressure in any veins. So the calf muscle is key in helping blood get back up to the veins. Sorry, back up towards the heart. So, but how does all this affect the skin? How do you end up with an leg ulcer at all? So we all we know already that the, when there's a damaged vein, the blood comes back down the vein, we need it to go up. But there's backflow down the vein, it creates high pressure, so venous hypertension. But 
that doesn't stop there. It keeps backing up the system and it goes all the way down to the tiny venules. And there's high pressure all the way down the veins, down the way into the venules. And then this is where the damage happens. If it was a central heating system or some other plumbing within your home or work, uh, if there was high pressure in a system, it'd just back up. It'd back up all the way through the system. That doesn't happen with your legs. The high pressure doesn't transfer back into the arteries. What happens is there's damage here. So when there's high pressure in these tiny little capillary beds, which are the tiny, tiniest end of the venous system, what happens is that fluid leaks out of the capillaries. They get so full, there's such high pressure in there. Fluid leaks out and it can cause leg swelling. Um, the iron content within the red blood cells can get squashed out because it's so packed in there and it can cause brown staining that you can see on your skin. So it's all about the high pressure right at the edge of these tiny veins and capillaries where fluid leaks out, red blood cells leak out, and with, it, with that, everything gets swollen, it all gets inflamed, and then the body starts trying to fix it, so it sends white blood cells there to try and fix this problem because it knows something's not right. And all this can cause itching, swelling, eczema, and ulceration. So it all comes down to this high pressure down in these capillary beds, which started off as backflow further up a vein. Okay. So this is what can ultimately present on the skin. If you've got high pressure within the veins, which is transferred back down the veins into the small capillaries, this is how the skin can be affected. So on this first image on the left here, you can see this very dry, quite itchy looking leg with a ulcer down at the bottom there. So that's a venous ulcer with some very dry eczema type skin. So you can get real thick, dry plaques of skin. On this second image here, you can see the typical brown staining. There's no ulceration, but you can see the typical brown staining. And that's also what we'd sometimes refer to as an inverted champagne bottle shaped leg. So the idea is that it looks a little bit like an upside down champagne bottle. But this can happen when the tissues around the ankle can get quite hard and fibrosed. And that can also happen with venous hypertension or high pressure within the veins. So this is a real typical picture of a patient with venous hypertension. There's brown staining, which is caused by the red blood cells being squeezed out through those capillaries. The iron content is squished out and stains the skin. Um, patients often ask, does it ever go away? Um, no, it doesn't go away completely, but um, sometimes it does fade a little, but um, I've never seen it go away completely, if I'm honest. Um, again, this third image along on the right, you can see this patient has varicose veins at the top near their trousers, quite significant staining, and then two venous leg ulcers here. You'll notice that the damage to these legs, it tends to be in the lower two thirds of the leg. This is where you'd usually see venous um, damage to the skin from venous disease. Okay. And then that final picture is what we'd, it's another picture of varicose eczema. So you can see there's tiny, small wounds. This will be extremely itchy, extremely sore. It's often mistaken for cellulitis or infection, um, but it's not, it's varicose eczema. So it's skin changes. So all that inflammation that I was talking about that happens inside the um, tissues can manifest itself as eczema. So it can be weeping wet eczema, or it can be really dry, itchy eczema. But again, we would treat this as you would any eczema, we treat it with steroid creams, but we know that it's caused by high pressure within the veins, so we have to treat it as venous disease as well, not just put creams on. So other signs of venous disease are venous hypertension. You can see this image here on the left. There's ankle flares, what we'd often call this. That's quite a dramatic picture. Don't know about you, but I've got a little bit of that. Not as bad as that, thankfully. But this is so common, particularly in people, women who have had children. Um, some ankle flare is really, really common sign of venous disease. So you know that your veins aren't working as well as they should if you've got some of these signs, or your patients do. Then again, in the middle, there's a picture of a varicose vein, which we've already mentioned. But here on the right, this is another 
image. So patients with venous disease can prevent with this kind of pale, um, almost white colored tissue. So the fancy term for that is atrophy blanch. But the point is that this can, the skin isn't broken, but it can be extremely tender or it can be itchy. But this is a sign of venous hypertension and venous disease. So all these things give you a clue that your veins or your patient's veins aren't working properly. So if they have a wound on their leg with these signs and symptoms, then the first thing you should be thinking is this is a venous leg ulcer. So if you have a wound on your leg that isn't healing and you have swelling or any of the signs that I've talked about just now with any of those images, then you're highly likely to have a venous leg ulcer. The important thing is that it is assessed by a health professional. Our website is fabulous. Um, there is loads of information on there, but we still don't want people to be self-diagnosing. You can get a very good idea of what you think the problem is with your own leg, which can really help to shape the discussions that you have with your health professional, but you must get a proper diagnosis. So the only way to be certain that you have a venous leg ulcer is to get a proper assessment. And that's usually by a nurse in either your GP practice or if you're housebound, a community nurse or a district nurse, or if you have one locally in a leg club. So if you've not heard of leg clubs, have a little Google afterwards because it's a fabulous organisation. So you may have a leg club locally. So you need to get a diagnosis. So once you've had your diagnosis of a treatment, of a, a treatment, of a venous leg ulcer, the main treatment is compression. And this is because we have to support the veins. I'm not talking about wound care. I'm talking about the cause of the problem, which is the high pressure in the veins, venous hypertension. So there's many ways in which we can provide good quality compression. I'm not talking about half strength compression. We need proper compression. Your clinicians will know what that means. We need full compression. Yes, we might start some patients in gentle compression. Um, they might have some hesitations. It might be just a, type, a case of building up compression until somebody's in full compression. But you can see here on the left, this is a wrap system. So it's like a Velcro wrap. In the center, that's a two layer compression hosiery system which is just support socks. And then on the right, there's a bandage. So either of these systems can provide the correct amount of compression for a venous leg ulcer. But what we need to do is figure out which is the best for you, which is most comfortable for you, um, which is more suitable for you, if depending on the shape of your leg, uh, depending on the size of the ulcer, depending on how much leaking there is coming out of the ulcer. But ultimately, we would be aiming to get all the patients, even if you need bandages in the short term, we'd be aiming to get all the venous leg ulcer patients in either a hosiery kit or a compression wrap. So you can start to manage your own condition with the support of a clinician. So you can change your own dressings, you can do your own skincare, and you can reapply your own compression and start to really own your condition. So the main treatment for a venous leg ulcer is compression. So dressings, um, we always have to mention dressings. As a specialist nurse who specializes in wound care, I am surprisingly disinterested in dressings. Posh plasters is what some people might call them. We do need to use good quality dressings, but do the dressings heal the leg ulcers? No, absolutely not. The dressings will help absorb fluid. Some dressings can help manage the levels of bacteria in a wound if that's necessary. But it, do the dressings heal the wounds? No, it is the compression that heals the wounds. So I have borrowed this slide of uh, the lovely Leanne. I love this. So this is Leanne's analogy. She gets 100% credit for this, but I love it. Um, Leanne's analogy is to compare a venous leg ulcer to a weed. Now, if you could see my front lawn, you would know it's small, but it's probably 80% weeds, I'll be honest. I'm better at leg ulcers than I am at gardening, I'll be honest. 
So my garden will be 80% weeds. I can make it look all right if I mow it. Uh, the weeds all seem to disappear. It can pass as grass and it looks better. But I haven't fixed the problem. I know that I haven't addressed the problem, which is the hundreds of roots from the weeds, which is in my lawn. Now, the analogy which Leanne uses is the venous leg ulceration is like the weed. And if we're just putting dressings on, like I'm making my lawn look all right, it looks better. We're kind of doing something. We're covering up the ulcer. We're keeping it clean. But we're not actually fixing the cause of the problem. We need to treat the cause of the problem, which is the high pressure in the veins. So I do love the weed analogy. Thank you, Leanne. So I have to mention the National Wound Care Strategy. So for patients or relatives who are listening, this is a national strategy, which is relatively new. Um, it's a fabulous piece of work. Um, if you're, I would suggest that you read it. There is a one page summary, which is very easy to read. Um, and it just gives you some kind of understanding of what kind of treatment to expect. Um, for, cl for clinicians who have not read it, please read it. Um, many, many organisations are implementing this now. So if you are one of the few places that aren't aware of this and aren't trying to implement the recommendations within this document, please do read it because I'm um, trying to get a standard high quality care across the country for people with leg ulcers because we really want to reduce these variations in care which we know are happening. So what treatment should I expect? So this is guided by the National Wound Care Strategy. So you should expect a full assessment within 14 days. So this is assessment by a health professional, usually a nurse, and in whichever setting it may be, GP practice, your own home or a clinic or a leg club, but it's a full assessment which will lead to a diagnosis. Although the majority of leg ulcers are venous, some aren't. So you need the diagnosis to, so we can show that the, we know what kind of ulcer it is. So this will involve the nurse looking at your leg, asking you lots of questions about how it um, started. Was it a knock? Was it a trauma which just hasn't healed? Did it just appear? Um, did it start as um, just a wet weeping area? Or did it start as eczema, which came really itching, is now a wound? So it, they really need to understand how it started. Um, how it feels, how your legs look. So does it, are there any of those symptoms that we've been looking at pictures of, varicose veins, ankle flare, eczema, edema or swelling, just to get a really good idea of what is causing that wound to not heal. So in with that assessment, you have a blood pressure test on your legs, which is referred to as a Doppler. Um, this is a straightforward test, which just gives the clinicians an idea of if the arteries are working properly. So is there enough blood coming down your leg? So that's to rule out any other cause of leg ulceration. But after this assessment with a venous leg ulcer, you'd obviously be given a diagnosis of venous hypertension and a venous leg ulcer. So then we need to look at factors which might delay healing. We know already venous hypertension is one of them. We know you need compression. But what else could it, what else could affect um, the healing of this wound. So smoking, um, weight, are you overweight or underweight? How much can you mobilise? How much exercise are you doing? Um, what underlying health conditions may you have? So, for example, if you're diabetic, is your diabetes well controlled? So there's lots of things which can affect he the healing of ulcers, which will be discussed in that assessment. So then other treatment to expect, um, wound care, wound dressings, obviously. So you, we just need dressings that will keep the wound clean and will absorb the fluid that leaks, which inevitably will leak from this wound. Um, wound cleansing, so keeping the wound clean and also skin cleansing. So cleaning the skin on the rest of your leg using um, plain non-perfumed moisturizers to keep the rest of your leg really well moisturized and, moisturized and hydrated and obviously compression therapy because we know we have to treat the veins not just the wound so compression therapy is an absolute essential part of venous leg ulcer treatment 
Another thing you might expect is a referral to a vascular specialist team for a scan of your veins. So this is another really straightforward scan. Um, it's similar to the ultrasound scan that pregnant women have, um, but they're not scanning your belly looking for babies. They're scanning the backs of your legs to look to see if there is any backflow in your veins. Do you have venous hypertension that a vascular team could help with? And when I say help with, there's some very simple day outpatient appointments. You're in and out in a day. It's very quick, very straightforward. Sometimes it might involve lasering the veins and that just really the aim of these treatments is to just take that damaged vein out of action. It will close down, stop working and the rest of the good quality veins within your leg will pick up the slack. So referral to a vascular specialist team for a scan is, is and should be becoming a more current, common occurrence. This is all based on the National Wound Care Strategy Guidance, but there's also really good quality research that's been done to show that earlier scanning of veins and earlier treatment um, by vascular teams of the damaged vein itself can really improve outcomes for venous leg ulcer patients. And then the last thing is, if you are receiving treatment for a venous leg ulcer, if it's not getting better, we need to know why. And it may be that you're going to your practice nurse and she has to know about venous leg ulcers, all the other leg ulcers, diabetes, asthma, children, contraception. She's, she's a generalist. She has to know a little bit about everything. So if she's assessed you, or he, sorry, very sexist, if your practice nurse has assessed you and it's not getting better, then it's about escalating that and getting a referral onto a specialist team. So can you be referred to a tissue viability nurse or a leg ulcer to service in the vascular, within your local vascular team. There may be a leg club you can attend. Um, so there's specialist services that you can be referred into because we need to know why it's not healing. We don't want to just manage these ulcers, we want to get them better. So the vast majority of these wounds should heal. We all have patients that don't heal. Some patients are extremely complex and that we know they're not going to heal. But for the vast majority of patients, they should heal in, within 12 weeks. So if things aren't getting better for your leg ulcer, just ask to be referred to a specialist team within your area. So what can you do to help your venous leg ulcer to heal? So you need to learn to love your compression. So if you're given some compression um, and the first lot you don't like it, you hate it, don't give up. There are so many different kinds of bandages, so many different kinds of hosiery, different kinds of wraps. Even the wraps made by different companies are slightly different. So you have a huge selection to choose from. And it's just a matter of working your way through to find the compression that you can live with, that is comfortable and that will help improve your leg. So you really need to learn to love your compression. Um, maintaining a healthy weight, if you're very overweight, that really doesn't help the venous system. It can really have impact on venous hypertension. So trying to maintain a healthy weight is really important. Regular exercise, so this, comes, this links to healthy weight, but it also comes back to the calf muscle pump. So using the calf muscle pump as well as you possibly can, depending on your ability. So if you're not able to move, you could use um, elasticated physio bands, therabands to just lift your foot up. There's something that everybody can do to try and exercise that calf muscle pump. If you're able to walk, try to walk for 30 minutes, three times a week. Good quality, heel to walking, heel to toe, try to avoid shuffling. It all comes back to the calf muscle pump. When you are sitting down, relaxing of an evening, put your legs up, give your veins a break. They are battling gravity all the time. So if you can put your legs up, it just helps. There's less gravity for them to battle. So just leg elevation when sitting is really important. Um, if you are a smoker, please get help to stop smoking. Smoking has got such a detrimental impact on any wound healing. Um, not just venous leg ulcers. So please consider getting some help to stop smoking. Um, eat a healthy diet. Um, this is all quite generic health advice, isn't it, really? Um, you could probably predict half of it. 
but it's so important. Your body is trying to fix a hole in your leg. It needs extra protein, vitamin C, zinc, all the nutrients which you get from a balanced, healthy diet. So eating a healthy diet is so important and really, really makes a massive impact on any wound healing, not just venous leg ulcers. Um, we need you to moisturize your skin. So even after your ulcer is healed, you need to continue to moisturize your skin, continue to wear your compression rosary, because unless you have had um, some intervention from a vascular team, and even then, if I'm honest, you will need to wear compression hose rates, right? a lifelong treatment. I wear them. I've eventually persuaded my father to wear them. But very interestingly, I persuaded dad to wear compression hose right? because his feet were getting quite swollen and he's got some magnificent purple veins down the side of his leg. He's never had an ulcer or eczema. He's quite lucky in that way. But he has got quite significant varicose veins. And he was, as he got older, he started getting leg swelling. So he was wearing some light support hosiery. It managed the swelling beautifully. But as he asked me then, well, can I start wearing these now? Because he thought that, oh, my legs aren't swollen now. I don't need these anymore. But when I explained to him that it's the stockings that are preventing the swelling. So my advice to him was he could only stop wearing his stockings when he stopped wearing his glasses. So in the same way the glasses help him see, they don't fix his eyes. So the compression hosiery helps his skin stay lovely and helps manage the swelling, but it hasn't fixed the veins. They're just managing it. And so he got it, and now he does wear them, which I'm thrilled. So um, he's learned to love his compression hosiery, and then um, he gets a bit um, bothered if he hasn't got them on now, which is great because it's really good lifelong leg health. And learn more about venous disease. Understand the condition more i've literally i rattled through it today giving you a real brief introduction i hope it's been helpful but there's so much more information out there so this is just an example of one of the leaflets on, on our website and um, it's also in the format of a web page but you can see on here it revisits what you can do about getting diagnosed treatments that you may be offered further health advice and then additional support you can get for help with venous hypertension venous leg ulcers as well, on our website, in the help and information section, there's a section that's labelled leg ulcers, wounds and non-healing sores. There's even more information in there. But if you scroll right down to the bottom, this is really lovely video. It's only five minutes long um, and it just summarises everything I've said today, but it's only five minutes. So it's really useful to go back to that. If you're a clinician, it's a great video to use in training. It's a great video to show patients. It's only five minutes while you're dealing with their legs or washing their legs, they could watch this on a phone. Um, so there's loads of information out there. And of course, there's the live lab this week. So there's a whole host of sessions tomorrow, Thursday and Friday. So please do register for the sessions or if you're um, unable to watch live, they're all going to be on our YouTube channel. They'll all be on Facebook. Um, so there's no excuse for not watching. So please, please check out the rest of the sessions in our live lounge this week. And finally, just to close, I really need to thank the corporate partners. Um, so these companies sponsor Legs Matter um, and without them, we wouldn't be able to put on events like this. We're nurses. Um, I'm not an IT expert. I'm certainly not a PR expert. So without the company's support, um, we wouldn't be able to do all this. So just to thank them specifically. So I'm going to close, I'm going to stop my sharing. There we go. And we'll take some questions. So if I look at the chat, oh, lots of questions. Right, let me start at the top. So first comment, really important that people recognise these signs so the correct advice and treatment is given. Start checking your legs regularly. Oh, this is Sarah plugging her own session tomorrow at 10 o'clock. It will be a fabulous session, so I agree. Join tomorrow at 10. Um, another comment from Hannah. If an ulcer presents as venous, but the patient has a history of factors such as diabetes, hypertension, ischemic heart disease, agina, et cetera, does that mean that the ulcer is classed as mixed arterial venous, or could it still be venous and therefore need strong compression? So Hannah's question is about patients that have a medical history which 
indicates that their arteries might, might not be functioning as well. So patients who have high blood pressure, diabetes and angina are patients whose cardiovascularly, their arteries aren't brilliant. So yes, Hannah, you're right to consider that in your assessment, but they might not have um, arterial disease to the extent that you can't put high compression on. So this just requires an assessment. If the Doppler was, is within normal limits, the patient can have strong compression. If it's a venous leg ulcer, they need strong compression. So you are exactly right to consider those factors in your holistic assessment. But if the patient's ABPI is normal, so that's the ankle brachial pressure index, which is the ratio, the calculation that we get when we're doing the blood pressure test on the legs, the Doppler. So if that reading is normal, these patients can have high compression. So once somebody's in compression, then you'd also judge the level of comfort, any new symptoms that they get. But we really need to try and be trying high compression with these patients if their ABPI is normal. But if you're stuck, if you're not sure, or if you're not confident, the main thing is not to leave it. Don't just put them in half strength compression because you're a bit nervous. Refer on to somebody else who can give you some advice so you know you're getting it right. Um, I hope that was helpful, Hannah. Next question. Will my GP take this seriously if I make an appointment to discuss these signs? I sometimes think it's put down to old age. Oh, gosh. Um, I hope so. Um, I think if you are having problems with your legs, particularly ulcers, so if you've got a wound on your leg that's been there for longer than two weeks, even if you did knock it on the car door or if it started as a cat scratch, um, if it's not got better in two weeks, it needs assessing. So it might not be that you need to see a GP. Um, you should, might try and book in with your practice nurse initially, but when you're ringing up to make these appointments, say that you think you might have a leg ulcer, say that you've got a wound on your leg that's not getting better. These things shouldn't be put down to old age. Um, I don't know how old you are, but it's, it's really important that age isn't a factor which determines what treatment people get. If someone presents with these symptoms, how old they are is irrelevant. Younger people can present with these symptoms, older people can present with these symptoms, and they all need the same high quality care. So next comment, you said about building up compression. Can you tell me how you actually do this? Yes. So if a patient is reluctant to go in compression, I've met many of these people over the years, and it's so satisfying when you get there. So initially, you try and explain to the patient why they need the compression, explain the venous hypertension, explain why dressings aren't going to fix the wound. Um, this might take a few appointments. No one's going to listen. To, if someone's reluctant and they've got an extremely painful leg, they're not going to just say, yes, okay then. So this might take a few times. It's your best interpersonal skills. Build a relationship with the patient. Bring them back. Try and explain again why it's so important. But the big thing, if they're finding their venous leg ulcer painful, is to try and explain that once we treat the venous hypertension, the pain should get better. It's such an alien concept to patients sometimes where you say, I know your leg is incredibly painful. I'd like to put this support bandage on. They look at you like you're crackers. So maybe do start gently. There was a patient I looked after years ago. Um, she'd had failed plastic surgery on her leg. And her leg was so swollen with this huge ulcer. She didn't, she had venous hypertension, um, a very edematous leg, a huge leg ulcer, but she would not have compression. No way. She wouldn't even let me put a bandage on it. But over, I'd say about six weeks, she let me put one really gentle bandage on, which probably fell down by the time she get home. And that, because that was okay, then she let me put it on a little bit more tight. Again, these bandages weren't doing anything to help her, but they were helping her trust me and helping her trust my decision making. And eventually I put a light support bandage on and then I pulled it to the proper tension. And over the weeks she got into full compression and she healed, but it took a long time and it took consistency, but she got there. So when you're talking about building up compression, if it's a large ulcer that needs bandages, you can introduce the higher compression gradually with the kind of bandages you choose. But if it's somebody who's gone straight into compression, um, into hosiery, sorry, 
you could start off with um, a lower strength of hosiery and then you could layer it. So if they can tolerate one, um, for example, we call liners, which is very, very light, negligible compression, really. It's not going to be helpful, but it's a good start. So if they can tolerate one liner, next time they come, they might be able to tolerate two. So it's all about, in, for the clinicians, it's all about increasing your knowledge of the compression that's out there and how you can slowly introduce it. And for the patients, it's all about understanding that the compression will help the pain of the venous leg ulcer as alien as that might seem. Um, let me see. This is amazing. This is, I should have this at home. Nobody argues back. I could talk like this at home forever. Um, so <laughs> next one. Um, my, bandage, my patients dislike compression bandages and they say they feel too tight. What do you suggest? Should we be using mild compression instead? No, you shouldn't be using mild compression instead. If the patient's complaining that the bandages are too tight, um, sometimes we have to be honest and look at how we're putting them on. Are we putting them on correctly? Are the clinicians who are doing it, are they applying them properly? Um, but it just could be that that kind of bandage doesn't suit that patient. You could try a different kind of compression bandage. So there's so much choice out there that um, don't just call it quits after a patient has said it feels too tight. But more importantly, please don't um, label the patient. Don't label them as difficult. Don't label them as non-compliant, which is a phrase that patients don't even understand. Um, these are real problems with real people. I haven't had a, ven a painful venous leg ulcer. I don't know how it understands, how it feels rather. But thankfully, we've got patient partners within Legs Matter who are brilliant at really bringing us back down to earth. As clinicians who have been doing this for a long, long time, um, we can think we know a lot, um, but there's nothing more grounding than a patient saying, don't call me non complaint. You've got no idea how this feels. Please try something else. So if the patient dislikes the compression bandage, we need to work with them. Don't label them as difficult and give up. We need to work with them to find something that suits them. Uh, next question. Will taking vitamin supplements help heal my leg ulcer? Ugh, there's nothing better than a healthy, balanced diet. If you're specifically deficient in vitamin C um, or any of the vitamins, then yes, a supplement might help. But that's not what's going to fix your venous leg ulcer. If you eat a balanced, healthy diet, you shouldn't need vitamin supplements. Um, but you really do need compression if you've got a venous leg ulcer. Um, how will I know that my patient's ulcer will never heal? Is there such a thing as a palliative wound? And who makes that decision? There are patients' leg ulcers that don't heal. But that is a decision that's not made by uh, a generalist nurse. Um, if nurses are looking after leg ulcers and they're not getting better, they need referring on to a specialist team, whether it's a specialist team like the one I work in or one in a vascular um, surgical team or um, any other uh, leg club. Um, if it's a lymphedema patient, you'd refer them into a lymphedema clinic. But there are wounds that will not heal. Um, some patients have got such complex needs and that these wounds aren't going to heal. But so in those cases, what we do is manage the symptoms. So we need to focus on managing the, how much leaking is coming out of the wound, if there's any smell from the wound, and manage the pain so that the patient's quality of life is as good as it can be. But that really is a specialist level decision to say that somebody's wound is not going to heal. This is not a decision that should be made in, by generalists in primary care or in community nursing. Um, because that's a very big decision and has, has huge impacts on people's lives. So that needs to be done by the specialists. OK. Um, how do we find links to the other tutorials? So if you go onto the Legs Matter website and you click on the link to the Live Lounge, so Legs Matter Awareness Week and the Live Lounge, and you can see, click on each day of the week and it will show you a full um, list of the sessions and you can just register with each one. OK. Uh, next question, do people find it difficult to get hosiery on and off? Where can they get help about this? 
there was a session today, Compression Hosiery Challenges, Hints and Tips. I watched that actually, um, and it was really good. So yes, sometimes when people are presented with compression hosiery, they look at you like you're crackers, um, particularly if they've been in bandages up until the point where they've healed, and then you wave this sock in front of them and say, now you have to wear this. Um, so that's one of the reasons we try and introduce hosiery kits, which is full compression in the form of a stocking. We try and introduce those much earlier. Um, but some people do struggle to get them on and off. Um, again, back to dad, I keep mentioning him, bless him. But he struggles to get them on and off. So he has, um, I've tried gadgets to help him, but he's extremely elderly. He's got dementia, so his care is helping. So yes, they can be difficult to get it on, get them on and off. There's a whole host of aids and applicators which are available on prescription, whether it's slidey fabrics that help the stocking slip over your foot or a more uh, structured frame where you can stretch the hosiery over. But if you go back to the session that was on earlier today, oh, what was the name of it? It's Compression Hosiery Challenges, Hints and Tips. Um, it was really useful and they went through all of those things. So you can watch that again um, on the YouTube channel, but please don't underestimate. don't sign. I think the most important thing is not to write people off. If the patient says to you, I can't get that on, then you work with them. Try the AIDS, can they get it on? If they really can't get the stocking on, even with the AIDS, could we do something different? Could you layer two compression liners? So if someone is in a, can't manage to get on a compression sock that would give them 20 millimeters of mercury, Two compression liners could be 10 millimetres of mercury each, much easier to get on. The patient's comfortable, happy, independent, and they're getting the same compression. So just it's finding workarounds. Use the aids and think about layering hosiery would be my um, suggestions and watch the session that was on today and catch up. Um, next question. If I have varicose veins, does this mean I'll get leg ulcers? If so, what can I do? to pre prevent this, I'm guessing that would be. So if you're on varicose veins, no, it doesn't mean you will get leg ulcers. Again, back to dad, he'll love this, must tell him. Um, he's got purple snakes down the side of his legs. He's had them like that for years and years and years. Um, when he was younger and fitter, he walked constantly. Um, so his calf muscle was particularly active, but he now had a venous leg ulcer, thank goodness. So not everybody with varicose veins will get a venous leg ulcer. If you have got varicose veins, however, you know that your venous system isn't working properly. You know you've got venous hypertension. Um, so I know that I've got ankle flare around my foot. Uh, I know I might be heading down the road of having the same lovely legs as dad. So I wear compression hosiery. Do I wear it every day? No. I'll be honest. Do I wear it when it's 25 degrees outside? No, but I do wear it to work. Um, I do wear it for flights. I wear it for long journeys. It's about normalizing compression hosiery. So if you've got any signs of venous hypertension that I've mentioned today, it doesn't matter how old you are. This is not an elderly person's problem, even though I've mentioned my elderly dad a hundred times. It's not an elderly person's problem. Um, we need younger people, pregnant women, um, butchers, hairdressers, nurses, anyone who's working on their feet or standing or standing still or quite still for long periods of time, their veins will be under such pressure. Um, they need to pick up on these early signs like the varicose veins. And if you want to prevent future leg ulcers, future leg edema, then you must start wearing compression hose. We need to make it normal. There's some lovely ones, very comfortable, quite slinky. It's not the, um, although I did have a picture of a beige one on the screen, that probably serves me right. Um, there are some quite jazzy colours. You can get dual stockings. Um, there's a whole host of range. It's just about it becoming normal in society. Um, that's how you prevent getting a venous leg also. Uh, next question, can compression be used in patients with cardiac failure? Uh, it depends, is the honest answer. That requires a specialist assessment. If a patient has a history of heart failure, when you're looking at a patient's medical history, 
the presence of heart failure within their medical history does not prevent compression therapy. If they are in active heart failure, so if they've got uncontrolled edema, which may come up even as far as their sacrum, that's more of a concern. So that needs a medical review and you need to consider um, managing that patient. That patient's heart failure needs to be managed. Um, I wouldn't start compression on a patient who was in active heart failure, who had a lot of edema all the way up their legs. Um, so if you're not sure, get help, get, some, get a second opinion, ask a GP to review the patient's cardiac status, um, refer on to a specialist nurse. The main thing is, if you're not sure, don't do nothing. I know that's a double negative, but the main thing is don't do nothing. Find who can help you. Work with the cardiac teams. Work with your tissue viability nurses. There's plenty of patients who have cardiac failure and are in compression. So it's all about that initial assessment, the holistic assessment of the patient. And if you're not sure, get some help. Don't just leave it. That would be my advice. Um, uh, all the webinars from this week on the Legs Matter website, they are. Um, or on the, I found it easier to find them through the YouTube channel. So if you go onto Legs Matter through YouTube, um, all the sessions will be uploaded onto there. And there's previous sessions from last year's um, Awareness Week, actually, which is also worth a look. Um, so I've got another message here. I've got varicose veins. I'm 51. I had them stripped already a few years ago. I'm very active. I'm walking, cycling, hit workouts. Check you out. Good for you. Um, should I use compression stockings? Yes. Yes, I would. I mean, the surgical intervention, so you've had your veins stripped, that can help. Does it help for life? We're not sure. Honest, my honest opinion, if I was you, I would wear them. Again, wear them if you're um, going on long journeys. Um, you don't need to wear them if you're out walking and doing hip workouts. That sounds fabulous. But it sounds already that you've got a really good understanding of your own leg, leg health. So if you get if you see venous changes in your legs again, get your stockings back on. If you're going on a long journey, get your stockings back on. So it's just building it into your life. But yes, I would suggest some compression stockings. Um, so one last comment. Oh, Tracy, who is Tracy Goodwin, who is our patient partner within the Legs Matter Coalition, or one of them, sorry. Um, she's going to be talking about her experience of living with leg ulcers on Friday at five o'clock. It's always worth listening to Tracy. Every time I listen to her, it's extremely humbling as a clinician, but it's so useful to help you understand the patient's perspective. Um, concepts like non-compliance, um, when Tracy mentioned to all of us that she didn't even know what that meant, that was so humbling for us. Um, and you just realise that sometimes the language that we use and the assumptions that we make about patients are really, really unhelpful. Um, so I'd highly recommend listening to Tracy. I love hearing her speak about her experiences. I always learn something, even if I've heard her speak 10 times before. But um, yeah, that would be really fabulous. So any more questions? I don't think so. I've quite enjoyed talking to myself and challenged. I'm going to expect this from my family for the rest of the evening. So if there's no more questions, then we'll call it a night. So thank you very much everybody for attending and please do check out the Legs Matter website for all our sessions for the rest of the week. Okay, thank you.